Media is changing, don't get me wrong. Uh, share of voice is changing, so there's more different media out there, so people are consuming more varied media. So there's a new place of hybridity that's really exciting in photography right now, where you have the tools from old and the tools from new, and they can come together and you can do things that just weren't possible before. And I think that there are some that all they want to do is sort of live in the past. There's that nostalgia factor. There's the you know, I liked when games were maybe a little bit simpler technologically. They were a little bit easier to understand. And there's certainly, and we see it in the museum when guests come through, there's certainly an audience that they respond to the games that they played as a kid. You see the memories rush back. Humanity never ceases in advancing technology. Throughout the ages, we as a species have always taken many steps forward. From MP3 players to smartphones and Polaroid cameras to high-definition video recording, there might be a reason why many of us don't concern ourselves with these tokens of the past. But what about those who do? Is it simply a sense of nostalgia? Or is it a feeling time can't limit? Should these mediums be preserved for generations to come? Katie Hubbard is an associate professor at SUNY Brockport teaching photography. She has used older cameras and digital phones in tandem throughout her career. I have a lot of thoughts about moving from film to digital. I mean, because I was there for, for it happening. Um, in my life, I was in graduate school when the digital transition was happening. And I started to see things that I really enjoyed, like working with color. Editing in Photoshop, I definitely, you know, it opened me up to different ways of working than I would have worked with film. And using scanners, I use scanners a lot as cameras to capture images. I had a principal who was into photography and she was a woman, and so we had a dark room in our high school, which was really nice. And so I got exposed to photography then, and then in college, I just really, fell in love with it and um, I took a film, a number of film courses there and concentrated in photography. So now that digital is something, I feel like my knowledge in film photography and the fact that we teach a film course is really useful here because you understand more about how it, the whole media evolved and how it works. Kitty sees value in giving her students opportunities to learn several forms of photography. The action of light on either a silver-based surface such as film or photo paper is one thing. The light effect on a DSLR sensor is a similar thing. But I think it's easier if you understand film first. I, I definitely find if students take either film before digital, they're much better in digital. If they take digital before film, it can help them too. But, um, but a combination of both I think is really important. However, in an ever-expanding market of digital services and virtual records, film photography becomes harder to use. I think it's important to save the older cameras for the future, uh, just as examples for historical reasons to understand how technology has developed because photography was officially invented in 1930, or 1839, so it's not even that old. The brief history that it has has been very robust and those innovations inform future innovations, so I think it is important. One of the oldest forms of modern media, radio, has been available to the public since the early 20th century. But with such an emphasis on visual media in the world of today, does radio deserve to still have its place and be remembered? Warren Kozareski, known as Koz by his students, is a professor at the State University of New York, or SUNY Brockport, teaching journalism and broadcasting. 
He is also the general manager of the on-campus radio station 89.1 The Point. When it comes to audio-based mediums, Kaz's knowledge is vast. I think, you know, it's been said over and over again, radio is the original social media. Um, the DJ was the original social media poster. You just put something out over the air and waited for calls back in the day. Now you would get texts or receive feedback on your social media platforms within your radio station. So that's all changed, but radio is the original social media. Um, you listen because you want to know what was happening. That was Lizzo with Cuz I Love You. You're listening to 89.1 The Point. I'm Ryan Hermanat. Good morning this morning in pop culture news. Ozzy Osbourne, after just undergoing spinal surgery, um, his son announced that he's likely not going to be touring again. However, he's not done performing. Cuz works alongside his students every day at the radio station for all to tune in, even despite common sentiments that radio is a dying medium. Uh, sometimes more so, I think. Um, it's still reached by 90% of the American public on a monthly basis. Unlike like traditional television and cable television, they're both tanking, newspapers tanking. Media's changing, don't get me wrong. Uh, share of voice is changing, so there's more different media out there, so people are consuming more varied media, but they're still consuming radio as part of that mix. The whole idea of media, period, radio specifically, is learning what ticks with the audience, what engages the audience. So it's, in, in my mind, we should all be honorary sociology and psychology majors. Um, and that will help you in whatever area, whatever field you work in, learning what the audience wants and how to deliver it to them is not a bad thing. Well, at the student level, I think it's a great experience for anybody. Um, you know, I've, we've had students working here and they're now doing recruitment. They're now doing IT, they're now doing all these various fields, but here they learned how to public speak, how to engage with an audience, either in the station itself, on the air, or at a PR event, for example. All these different soft skills or skill sets can be learned within the, within the radio station people don't even think about. People think radio, oh, I don't want to be a DJ, so I don't want to work there. It's so much more than that. Social media, website design, sales, uh, engineering side of things. Uh, it's, there's a bunch of soft skills and hard skills you can learn, and the skill sets are transferable to other fields. Way down in the Congo land lived a happy chimpanzee. She loved a monkey with a long tail. Lord, how she loved him. One of the more surprising occurrences in the last 20 years is the resurgence of vinyl records. Despite modern equivalents in the form of streaming services, a demand for vinyl has resurfaced nonetheless. So is there so much of a need to preserve vinyl? Or has it already been? When I DJed originally, that's all we had was vinyl. Um, either 45s or albums. Personally, I still have a vinyl collection. Um, I know vinyl's coming back. Uh, many artists are releasing their stuff both digitally and on vinyl again. Uh, that's been going on for at least 10 years. Uh, as the relaunch of it, slowly but surely, but the issue is there are so few places to buy a turntable. Obviously online, Amazon has them, but in terms of your local mom and pop stores, it's harder and harder to find a turntable. You, you might, they might carry one. You, have the, you can buy this one or you don't buy one. You know, you used to have a selection of five, six, seven different turntables. So I, I think it's still there, but there's some things in the way of it growing faster. One of the fastest growing mediums in recent times have been video games. Becoming available to a commercial audience in the early 1970s, video games have sprawled into one of the most popular forms of entertainment today. In today's world, most video games can be easily shared on online marketplaces and made available to download online. However, as older hardware continues to age and break down, Will there be much of a record of games from this older era? Shane Reinwald is an employee and spokesperson for the Strong National Museum of Play, located in the city of Rochester. So the Strong is the only museum in the world that's all about play and the history of play. And we collect the objects of play, so toys, board games, 
and of course electronic games. So in the early 2000s, we had a few electronic games in the collection. The museum's most recently opened exhibit is the World Video Game Hall of Fame, dedicated to preserving these games for future generations to enjoy. But we really focused in on them and said we need to expand that because if you look at what has changed the way people play more than anything in the last few decades, including the way that people communicate across geographic boundaries, it is electronic games. You know, from the early games all the way up to the most modern mobile games, they have sort of revolutionized the play landscape. So in those early 2000s, we started to collect games in earnest so that we both had things to display and to talk about and to share with the public, but also to start those efforts of preserving those. These aren't just things that you might, you know, spend some time on your mobile phone, kill five minutes playing Temple Run. These are important cultural hallmarks. They mean as much to culture as movies, as novels, as rock and roll, and they really have become a big touchstone for everybody in the last few years. So at the museum, we are looking at how do we preserve the medium of electronic games? And there are a lot of people in the field, and there are people that we work with, and there are partners. But what is it that we as a museum can do that others can't? So one aspect of that is that we can collect things in mass. We can collect hardware, we can collect software. But there is a question of, will those things work in a few years? And I don't think for a lot of the hardware, the old console systems, that we're in imminent danger on many of them. But we all know that over time, technology, things will deteriorate. There will become a point where all of the, those no longer work. And so we are actively collecting them, but also working on other ways to preserve those things. But there's something to be said for actually being able to play it. And that's certainly something that in the digital game realm is under threat, is that there are so many digital games, they don't necessarily have physical or other forms. So how do you preserve as many of those as you can? And sometimes it's impossible to preserve all of those. So as scholars, as a museum, then the question becomes, how do we pick and choose what in 100 years will best represent a time period or a theme within gaming or a change within the industry? So what are the games that, it's not just the hardware, it's not just the software that tells these stories, it's also the marketing materials, it's the prototypes, it's the notes that came out pre-release that the designers were sending back and forth. That all encapsulates how these games were made and what they meant to us at any given point. People figure that out in the gaming industry early on, and you see a lot of those elements in games today, but it's important for those designers to be able to go back and see, okay, this is where this concept came from. And we're doing this in this big triple A game now, and it's fantastic and fun, but here's the journey of how we got here. And it's not just a technological journey necessarily. As time's current flows onward, it can be easy for old media to be washed away and forgotten. But there is still something to be gleaned from these facets of history, whether they impart skills to be carried across a lifetime or allow a simple entertaining pastime. Everyone, old and young, should be given the chance.